Professor Victor, La, uh, Victor Clark, who will who, who we talk today about fair trade.
is to have something valuable to give to someone else. It's one of the reasons that you're doing your studies right now. You're trying to make yourself better qualified, better educated, more attractive, and hopefully with that additional value, then you'll be able to find a job and find a job that pays relatively well, and you'll have an exciting career ahead of you. And that really is the bottom line of this talk, is that the way that a person can earn more money and have a nicer living is to have something valuable that someone else desires. And if you don't have something valuable that someone else desires, it's very difficult to make even a modest living. Uh, one, other, one other introductory comment before I begin. Do you see this lovely coffee cup, this yellow coffee cup? Every time I'm working on this presentation at my house, my lovely wife, she walks by and she says, oh, that's a lovely cup. I wish I knew where I could buy one. So every time I give this talk, I ask the audience, I ask you, if you know where I can buy this, please tell me so that I can make my lovely wife very, very happy. So see me afterward. And my comments this morning are based on the, the argument that I make in my short book, Fair Trade, Its Prospects is a po Poverty Solution. It was published last year in English and early this year in Polish by Pavina, and I'm very excited about it. So here's the introduction, and the introduction is simple. Fair Trade has enjoyed its biggest growth in coffee. Now, the international organization that certifies all Fair Trade products, they have expanded their offerings. So now you can buy Fair Trade bananas, Fair Trade footballs, many, many products. But I will focus today on coffee because it's the oldest Fair Trade product, and it's the one that is most easily seen. You can find Fair Trade coffee almost anywhere that you go. And the idea is very simple. People who have a lot, um, people from Europe, people from the United States, people who already have a lot, pay just a little extra for a cup of coffee at their local shop, and hopefully by paying just a little extra, then that little extra makes its way back through the coffee roaster, through the importer, all the way back to the individual small coffee grower in the country of origin. And it's a very nice idea. You pay a little extra. It's sort of like a tip for good service. And you pay a little extra at the front, and the money goes where it's needed the most. Well, why do we have fair trade coffee and other fair trade products like sports balls or bananas? Why do we have fair trade? And to understand why we began with fair trade in coffee, you need to know a little bit about the coffee market. And I'll talk very, very briefly about the coffee market. There are two kinds of beans, arabicas, which are highly prized for their mellow, mild flavor. They're also difficult to grow. They can only be grown at high elevations. So the primary coffee growing countries for Arabica beans are Colombia, Brazil, Guatemala, places with high altitude where these coffees can be grown and they're delicious. And they're well suited because of the high altitude. They're well suited to very small scale production. So small farmers can grow these Arabica beans. So they're highly prized because they're delicious and not easy to produce. The other kind is not delicious and very easy to produce. And that other kind is a robusta. It's called robusta because it's very robust. It can be grown almost anywhere. It doesn't die easily. As long as the climate is right, the elevation doesn't really matter. So it's suited to large-scale productions. Large plantations of coffee can grow robusta coffee. And the beans are less tasty. And they also have a bit more caffeine jolt. So if you've drunk uh, instant coffees, especially inexpensive instant coffees, you know sometimes they don't taste very good. It's because they have some robusta beans in the mix in those instant coffees. Well, why do we have fair trade in coffee? Two reasons, and the two reasons are both based on the price of coffee. One, one reason is that coffee prices move around too much from one season to another season, it's almost impossible for a coffee grower to know how valuable the crop will be. Sometimes the market price of coffee is high, and the farmer is richly rewarded. 
Other times, the price of coffee is very low, and you work very hard, you do your very best, and because everyone has had a good year, then the coffee price is low, and you can't sell it for very much. So one argument for fair trade is to insulate, to protect, to ensure coffee growers from these prices that move around so that they have a relatively constant price they can expect to sell their crop for in the market. The other argument is that coffee prices, well, they're just too low to begin with. So coffee growers, they work very hard, they work all day long, they do their best to earn a living, yet because of market forces, what they can sell one pound of coffee for in international markets isn't very much. So the two arguments, they, the prices move too much, and the average that they move around is a very low price. And here's a picture. A picture is always worth many, many words. This is a picture of two decades of world coffee prices. And the prices that you see on the diagram are from 1989 forward to the 2000, through 2010, so 20 years of prices. And the dark line, the lower line, the dark blue line, is the world price of one pound of coffee, Arabica beans, traded on the New York Commodity Exchange. And you can see that, yes, two things are true. One, the blue line, the lower line, the dark line, it moves around a lot. Sometimes the world coffee price is very high. Look at the price of coffee in early 1990s or near 1997, when there was bad weather in Brazil, where they grow the mellow, valuable Arabica beans when bad weather destroys the crop, the market price goes very high. And it's good to be a coffee grower. But then what happens? Coffee growers or potential coffee growers in other parts of the world, they see those spikes. They see the high price in the mid-90s. And they see the high price in the late 90s. And they go, oh, coffee prices are going up. Let's grow more coffee. And then what happens to the coffee price? Look in the diagram at what happens next. More coffee, more growers, the world price falls. So the price moves around a lot, and if you look at the average price across that diagram, again, the low line is the market price, you can see that the price doesn't really go up or down on average. It stays very constant. And the price is about $1 on average. It looks like about $1 per pound of coffee, US dollar across 20 years, and not much change, but lots of movement around that average. The lighter blue line is the fair trade price. Right now, the fair trade labeling organizations, the international organization that certifies fair trade coffee, so there's one world, worldwide agency that grants the license to give coffee the fair trade stamp. They guarantee member coffee growers a minimum of $1.25. A minimum of $1.25 no matter what happens to the world price. So if you look at early 2000s when the world price was very low because many people started growing coffee who hadn't been before, fair trade farmers were guaranteed $1.25. And you can see the horizontal light blue line above the diagram. So everyone else in the world, large coffee growers, Coffee growers who weren't part of fair trade, they're earning less than a dollar. They're growing coffee, they're working just as hard, they're earning less than one dollar. The fair trade coffee growers are earning 125 plus additional 10 cents for some community projects. So coffee prices are low, true. And do they move around a lot? Are they volatile? Also, yes, true. So let's take each of those questions in turn. Why do coffee prices move so much? And why are they so low? And let's begin first with the volatility. Um, I'm an economist, so though I will use one new economics term today, and the economics term is elasticity. It means sensitivity. When a price changes, we buyers, we change our habits. When the price of a good goes up, we buy less. When the price of a good goes down, we buy more. And sometimes we're very responsive. Sometimes if something goes on sale or has a very low price, we buy what we need for today and maybe a little extra for tomorrow and we store it. Other times, we're, we're not so sensitive. For example, with gasoline for cars. When the price goes up, 
Maybe we buy less, but we don't buy very much less. We have the same car, the same trips, the same distances to school and to work. And so when the price of gasoline rises, we buy less, but not very much less. And so we say that demand is not very elastic. It's not very responsive. It's inelastic. And it's one of the reasons why gasoline has such high taxes. Government knows, oh, the people will keep buying the gasoline even if we add on a tax because demand is not very responsive. It's very inelastic. The demand for coffee is like the demand for gasoline. If you are a coffee drinker, you know this. You need to have a cup in the morning, maybe a cup after lunch to keep going, and maybe you drink three cups a day or four cups a day. And even if the price rises, maybe the price rises 20% or 25%. If you have a caffeine habit and you are feeling tired and you need to wake up, well, you'll probably buy about the same number of, number of cups of coffee. And the opposite is true. If the price goes down, Will you then drink 10 cups a day, 12 cups a day? Probably not. You'd be too nervous, wouldn't be able to study for an exam. It would be bad if you're drinking so much coffee. So you'd be worried, lying, lying awake at night. Um, so no matter what happens to the price of coffee, if people drink three cups a day or four cups a day, it doesn't matter what happens, much what's ha what happens to the price. They buy about the same quantity. So that's one part of it, that the demand for coffee is not responsive to price change. The problem for coffee growers is, is that the same is true on their side of the market, on the supply side. The supply of coffee doesn't respond much to price either, at least in the short term. And the reason is this. Normally, when the price of something goes up, the sellers want to sell more. But coffee is grown in a season, and you have to plant new plants to produce more coffee. So even if the price of coffee goes high, like it has lately, right now the price of coffee is at a 30-year high. Would coffee growers like to sell more coffee? Yes. Do they have it in an inventory, in a warehouse, stored somewhere? No. If they want to grow more coffee, they have to plant more <coughs> coffee. And planting coffee takes time. So the su supply of coffee is price inelastic to suppliers in a short amount of time. Even if the price goes very high, they cannot deliver more coffee to the market. And why is it? If you plant a new Robusta, it takes three years before that coffee plant begins to yield new coffee that can be harvested. For the tastier Arabica beans, even longer, three years to five years between planting and being able to harvest. And finally, once mature, a coffee plant will last about 10 years. So if the coffee price goes high, like it did in the 1990s, and new coffee growers begin planting more plants because the price is high, then those plants will be available for the next decade. Another reason supply is price inelastic is that coffee has to be roasted before we drink it. And at any moment in time, there's a fixed capacity for coffee roasting in the market. So coffee roasting is like oil <coughs> refining. Um, we don't put oil in our cars, we put gasoline. And, one of, and the step that has to happen first between oil and gasoline is the refining. And co coffee roasting is like refining the coffee for our consumption. So I'm an economist, so we have one supply-demand diagram. One, and here it is this morning. So what I've done is I've drawn a market for coffee, and I've drawn supply and demand. And if you look at both of those curves, and you see that the price of coffee is on the vertical axis, and how much coffee is on the horizontal, then you'll see that I've drawn those curves so that they're almost vertical, almost straight up and down. I did that because drawing them vertically means that the price, the supply, and the demand of the price on both sides of the market is inelastic. So no matter what happens to the price of coffee, the quantity demanded stays relatively constant along that line. And in the short term, no matter what happens to the price of coffee, does the quantity supply increase? Yes, but only very little. So let's use this model as a tool to see why coffee prices move so much. In my diagram, the coffee price is very low. Very, very, very low. And then let's have a common example. Let's have 
a flood in Brazil, a frost in Brazil, let's damage some of that Brazilian cotton crop. What happens? It changes the supply. And even if it's only a little change in supply, that change in supply matters. Let's take a look. So there's the original supply when the price is low. And then let's make it vanish, but we'll remember where it was. And then let's have the bad weather. There's my new supply curve. A little bad weather, a big increase in the price. Very big increase in the price. So the reason that copy prices are so volatile is because when both supply and demand are very price unresponsive, tiny, tiny changes, big fluctuations in price, big volatility in price. So now we've explained why copy prices move so much. Why are copy prices so low? Well, over the long term, and you've seen it in the diagram, the world has experienced a sustained increase in the supply of copy. Why is the price of anything low? When there's a lot of it. And that's definitely true for the global supply of copy. At the same time, there's been a decrease in demand globally for copy. So while expensive copy drinks, Starbucks, uh, fancy drinks, while the demand for those things has gone up, Overall, global demand for coffee in general has been volatile. And I know the United States best, so I'll talk about it. In the 1960s, a typical person drank over three cups per day in the United States. But by the 1990s, only a little over one and a half cups per day. So the demand for coffee was roughly half after just about 30, 35 years. And at the same time, rapidly growing global supply. There are more robustas on the market than ever before. Vietnam has begun growing robustas. And 15 years ago, Vietnam, Vietnam grew no coffee. 15 years ago, Vietnam was not a coffee, major coffee export. They just weren't. And then those price spikes that you saw in the 1990s happened. During the 1990s, Vietnam went from being nobody, not a producer of coffee, they increased their coffee production by 1,400% and became the number two global coffee producer. If you, were, if you were already growing coffee, Vietnam is bad for business. If you were already a coffee grower, the entry of Vietnam is very, very bad for business. So we've had the surging supply, increasing share of robustness. On top of that, coffee growers get smarter. They find cheaper ways to grow their coffee, better technology, and better fertilizer to increase the yield from the same amount of land. So let me explain quickly for those who aren't aware. Let me explain the fair trade model, because the fair trade model is very interesting. Um, one way to think about the fair trade model is it's a way to create market power through scarcity. Fair trade is similar to monopoly strategy, and I'll explain why. Every seller wants to be the only seller. Every seller wants to have just a little, be able to be the monopolist, the only seller, and charge a very high price, and eliminate competition whenever possible. And that's always been true in the coffee market. The literature of economics is full of stories of greedy companies who try to knock out their competition and have a monopoly or something close to it. Or if they don't knock, off the knock out the competition, they have a meeting, they negotiate a price, or they negotiate a quota, and they keep the price artificially high by conspiring together. And economists refer to this power through scarcity as monopoly power. During most of the 20th century, Brazil was the world's primary coffee grower and because they were the primary coffee grower, even though they were already a monopoly, they tried to drive the price of Brazilian coffee even higher. How did they do it? They made less coffee available. So in 1937 alone, the Brazilian government, in an effort to try to keep the world price of coffee high, they set fire to over 17 million bags of their own coffee. Why? The other coffee that was left was more valuable that way. 
So only 30% of the coffee crop in Brazil that year made it to the market. So Brazil had, virtually speaking, a monopoly in coffee production. What happened? Colombia started to grow coffee. Oh, big surprise. High coffee prices, a little competition. So Colombia began to grow coffee. They also had high altitude. They could also grow Arabica beans. Colombia's arrival on the scene was inevitable. And same story as Vietnam. In 1900, Colombia wasn't a coffee grower. They produced 600,000 bags. By the 1930s, when Brazil was burning coffee, Colombia made three and a half million bags of coffee. So yeah, Vietnam was just the new Colombia. It's a different decade, different century. But the entry of Vietnam was inevitable, just like the entry of Colombia was inevitable. Now, Brazil, they were the monopolists, so they sought high prices by destroying their crop. Colombians were clever. They used clever marketing. They introduced this logo, Café de Colombia. The gentleman's name is Juan Valdez. And if you saw Juan Valdez's picture on Colombian coffee, you knew it was mountain-grown, Arabica, mild, mellow, and delicious. So they used marketing, very skillful, to attract new buyers. Well, there was, just like Colombia entered the market, other South American countries began to enter the coffee-producing market also. So the coffee growers realized, this is terrible. There's more and more competition. It's going to wipe us out. It's going to lower the price. What can we do? So in 1962, at the United Nations Coffee Conference, a quota system, a treaty, was negotiated between coffee-growing countries and other members of the UN. And so they established a limit, a limit for Brazil's production, a limit for Colombia's production, a limit for other countries' production, so that they would have power through scarcity and not be competing with each other. They formed a cartel. They formed a cartel through this UN Coffee Conference to keep the price high. And it gained United States support at the time because the American government was very concerned about the threat of Marxism in those South American countries. So they wanted to be diplomatic, keep the peace, and one way to do that was agree to the quota system. But the cartel arrangement, the ICA, the International Coffee Agreement, it fell apart at the, end of, at the end of the 1980s because the Soviet experiment was winding down and Americans didn't perceive that Marxist threat in South America to be so strong. So they said, forget it. We're not gonna pay that high price anymore. We'll take the market price. Thank you very much. And they walked away from the agreement. So this set the stage for fair trade as we know it. And even though the Marxist threat was largely gone by the end of the 1980s, the United States was still concerned about some individual countries in particular. And what they were very concerned about was Nicaragua. They were very concerned about that regime. And they, rather than be nice, the United States imposed a trade block, a trade embargo, and refused to buy any goods. There we go. Refused to buy any goods from Nicaragua. And a for-profit company called Equal Exchange was the first American fair trade coffee importer. And they did it by exploiting a trade loophole. There was a, there was a gap in the trade legislation, and Equal Exchange was able to bring what should have been forbidden coffee in from Nicaragua and sell it in the United States as fair trade coffee. And that was the first fair trade coffee in the United States. The first in Europe was there were some Mexican farmers living in the Mexican state of Oaxaca, and they worked together with an international organization called Solidaridad to form the first national fair trade label called Max Havilar in the Netherlands. So that was the beginning of the fair trade movement. Today, the international organization, FLO, Fair Trade Labeling Organizations International, is the single body that grants the stamp. Now, each individual nation has its own certifier. In the United States, we have Fair Trade USA. 
In the Netherlands, they still have Max Havelar. In the, in the UK, they have the Fair Trade Foundation. And each of those individual entities in each country gives that country stamp. But everything is controlled by the umbrella group, the larger organization, the International FLO. And that's a picture that I took with my telephone the other day. I bought some equal exchange coffee. And you can see what they're promising. You're buying this coffee from a small farmer. And in exchange for the extra price that you pay, there will be a big change. So how does the, fair, the FLO operate? Well, the FLO is basically looking for power through scarcity. So how do they do this? First, not any coffee grower can sell fair trade coffee. You have to be small. You have to be a family farm. You have to be a small scale grower. Even though most coffee in the world is grown by large scale coffee growers because it's very efficient, it's very cost effective, it's environmentally friendly to have a very large scale, if you buy fair trade coffee, it can only be produced by a small farmer. And not individual small farmers, those small farmers have to band together and form their own cooperative, their own team. And then these poor farmers seeking a higher price for their coffee, the fair trade price, they have to send an application to FLO, to Fair Trade Labeling Organizations International. And the application fee, the poor farmers have to pay $3,200 to apply. And just because you apply doesn't guarantee a contract. It means you just ask, can we please sell our copy for the higher fair trade price? So the price, the price of application rose by 2004 to 3,200 US dollars. And the price was introduced because it was obvious fair trade copy cost pays better. Lots and lots of poor farmers wanted to sell fair trade copy. They were very interested, and so the application fee began. And there's very stiff competition. Many poor copy growers would like access to the fair trade market, but they cannot get it. In fact, one cooperative, one collective of small farmers, they looked for eight years for a company like Equal Exchange who would be willing to buy their coffee because they thought that there was a market for it at the, the fair trade price of $1.25. So the most important question is, now that we've talked about why coffee prices are low, why are they moving so much? and the design of fair trade, what we need to ask is, well, can fair trade work as it's designed? Well, one thing to ask is, when a consumer buys a cup of coffee, what's in there besides the coffee? There must be something. Otherwise, we wouldn't pay extra for it. Normally, you don't pay a little extra for nothing. You pay a little extra when you perceive that there's something, something extra that you're getting in exchange. And so one of the things, uh, there's, a, there's a large and growing marketing literature about why people will pay more money for the same coffee if it says fair trade. And one idea is this idea in marketing called, if, you're, if you've studied marketing, you know this expression, bundling, that you can package together two goods. And bundled together, packaged together, consumers will behave differently than they would if the goods were separate. And in this case, the idea is there's bundling. Marketing professors have studied this and they say, oh. It's like consumers are buying two goods at the same time. They're buying a hot, delicious cup of coffee. And at the same time, they're buying justice. They're buying charity. They're buying goodwill. They're buying doing good. And they're willing to pay a little extra because they're buying both of those things at the same time. But if you buy a cup of fair trade coffee, like I did last week and you saw the picture, you can't really see whether what you're doing is doing some good. If I help someone in my local com community that I know and that I give some money to, or if I give some money to an NGO that I know is doing some good work, I have lots of good information about the difference. With Fair Trade Coffee, I see the sign. It sounds like a good idea. It sounds like some, I'm a nice person, so I should probably buy the Fair Trade Coffee, so I pay a little extra. And hopefully, some of that money gets to the farmers that I'm trying to help. 
And fair trade coffee is a growing segment of the market. Another idea, though, is this, that when people buy fair trade coffee, it's not generous, it's selfish. And here's the selfish reason. If you and I go into a coffee <coughs> shop together and there's a choice, fair trade coffee or not fair trade coffee, I have an opportunity to improve my reputation as a caring, generous, kind person who wants the poor to do better. And if you see me pay a little extra for the fair trade coffee, then maybe you have a higher respect for me, a higher regard in your esteem. I'm a better person. And if I keep doing that, not only with you, but you come to my house and I serve you fair trade coffee, I let my students know that I buy fair trade coffee because that's the cup that I bring into me in the class with me every day, then they'll think, oh, Professor Clark, he's a good guy. He buys fair trade coffee. And I will have a nicer life because the people that I know have changed their opinion of me. So, may, so this idea of economics is I'm buying capital, but I'm not buying a machine, I'm not buying a tool, I'm not buying a factory. What I'm buying is social capital. If I pay a little extra money for coffee, it will pay off because people will be nicer to me because they know, oh, the bar is a good guy. He's a caring person. He drinks fair trade coffee. Well, another way to think about fair trade, then, is it really can be viewed as a marketing campaign. And a third way to look at, at fair trade coffee is as a form of price discrimination. Now, discrimination normally is a bad word. Racial discrimination, sexual discrimination, um, ethnic discrimination. Discrimination normally is a bad word. And it's a bad word. Why? Because you treat different people differently based on how they look, based on how they talk, based on how they act. We treat different people differently. In economics, we have this idea of price discrimination. And price discrimination is charging different people different prices for exactly the same good. And firms would love to do this all the time. Let me give a short example. Suppose that I run a shop. Suppose that I run a shop, and everyone in this room would like to stop by the shop and buy a liter of milk from my shop. One thing I could do, one way I could price the milk is I could put a label on the shelf in front of the milk and everyone could see the price and come to the counter and everyone pays the same price. But I know I could make more money. And, the way, and one way I could make more money is if my greatest wish comes true and every time a new customer walks into my shop to buy milk, in my magical shop, my enchanted shop, every time a customer walks in, above that customer's head, I can see the maximum price that I could charge that customer. So I no longer have to settle for charging everyone the same price. If I knew that, I could charge everyone a different price, and the money in the drawer at the end of the day would be much, much bigger. And we see this, we see this in our regular, in, in our everyday life. Plane tickets are priced based on how, how far in advance you buy the plane ticket, or do you need to go somewhere tomorrow? The price is changed. If you need to go somewhere tomorrow, you must need to go pretty bad. If you're looking three months in advance, four months in advance, then maybe you'll be more price sensitive. Maybe your demand is more price elastic if you have more time. 